You are about to witness history in the making. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another Picard special. It's uh, Picard special number four for the Pop Culture Gamers. Uh, my name's Hayden, and I'm here as always with Alan. Hello, Alan. Hey, Hayden, how are you? Kind of start to. Yeah. Or, I'm sh- not... or should I say, top of the morning to you. Ah, <laughs> oh, top of the morning to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're still sore over that accent, aren't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and there was me thinking you were a teensy bit starstruck. Oh, to be sure, to be sure. <laughs> well, I have to admit, it's been quite funny uh, today because my wife never, ever listens to the show. When she found out, you know, she's known that you're Irish, but she said, oh, let's have a listen to him. And then she's like, she wouldn't switch it off. She was just listening to you. She said, I don't know who that other guy is. But, you know, i.e. me, but, you know, she she liked your voice, so there you go. That's very kind of her. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> I, w- I would as well, because she's she uh, knows all about what voices are like, because she never stops talking. Oh, like most wives. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, so, anyway, we're here to talk about absolute candour, yeah. which is uh, episode four of Star Trek, which aired on... Well, Friday here, Thursday in the US. So, uh, just doing our normal rundown, obviously, just a big, big warning for anybody who's not come across this show before, that we do do spoilers. You know, this is a spoiler warning. Mm-hmm. If you proceed, you're going to get the whole show spoiled for you if you have not seen it. So, you have been warned and forever hold your peace. So... It starts off with the normal sort of um, rundown, and this time it's showing about Picard uh, being interviewed. Um, the thing about the picture that was in uh, Picard's vault as well, that was painted by Data, you know, 20 years previously, which uh, showed Daj's face. And then there's a uh, show to you the Romulan death squad about finding Maddox and the Borg cube. So all of that, that was in the uh, intro. Yeah. And then we cut to the main part of the show, because obviously that's what we're here for. Uh, and this is uh, Veshti, which is uh, the Romulan relocation hub 14 years before the rest of the show. True, yes. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, Veshti is actually named after Queen Vesti of Persia and the first wife of the king of Persia, uh, Ahurus, in the Book of Esther and a book uh, included in the Tanaka um, and read on a Jewish holiday of Purim. And she was banished from her uh, refusal to appear at the king's banquet to show her beauty as the king wished and Esther was chosen to succeed her as queen. So I'm wondering, is that going to, you know, is that sort of like kind of mythology going to somehow fade in? Because they tend to do this with stuff, don't they? They do, yeah. They do tend to uh, do that kind of stuff, all right, in in the Star Trek universe. Um, I didn't realise it was related to that book, no, so that's interesting. To, to hear you speak about it, yeah. Um, but yeah, for, again, another little, small little things they do in the show. You know, it's great. It is. Um, yeah. And also the Vesti, you kind of see a lot more in the comics. I was talking about in a, yeah. a couple of, I think it was the first and second episodes we've done, and later on also there's a book that goes into a lot more detail on this as well, which we'll talk about. Yeah, well, you've already got that book, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I've listened to it. Or listen to it, and I've. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, just picked that up on Audible yeah. as well. So yeah. um, I'm actually, I'm going to pick up the uh, Picard uh, graphic novel as well. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. It's very yeah. good. 
Yeah, definitely. I need to see some of this background info. Yeah, as for research. For purposes. research, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we cut to an outside scene, and it's showing lots of uh, people, humans, and Romulans about, and Picard beams down in civilian clothing. Now he's an admiral at this point, yeah. but I was struck by how much he looks like uh, Balok off Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> I always think he did the man from Del Monte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he also looks like that as well. Yeah, um, that's I kept thinking the man from Del Monte. He says yes. That's all I kept thinking about when I saw him. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I was thinking it would uh, 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 Balok for the quite simple reason that um, obviously Balok reads Lost Ark. He was an archaeologist, and we do know that Picard has a love for archaeology. Yeah, and maybe it was in some way sort of like referencing that yeah a great connection actually that's a good connection between the outfit and yeah yeah so that that was just that's because that just immediately popped into my head and you know you always remember you know that uh sort of like head with the little figures yeah that he had that was in his ready room as well so i was just like sort of thinking about that sort of stuff um, anyway, Picard starts to greet people and they're all coming up to him. They all love him, you know, and he's going Joe Lantru. Yes. Uh, so Joe Lantru, this is a Romulan greeting, which means peace be with you. And it was first heard on uh, the Next Generation episode, Reunification, where Picard goes to Romulus to find uh, Ambassador Spock. Yes, that's season five, I think. Yeah. That was on, yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, the first time we heard that being used. So, and it was the opening of the palm to the hands. It was nice to see again, you know. You know. Yeah. Um, so, a little boy runs up. This boy has significance later on uh, in things. And, um, you know, he, to the boy, then it c- cuts to the scene um, with the boy running up into this. It's a kind of a monastery, but it looks more like, um, you know, an outside area with a load of curtains hung yeah. up to sort of like hide some of the background. <laughs> it's so. more what it looks like, isn't it? Just a, yeah, just a kind of assess. They kind of hung some curtains around, really. Um, I think they kind of use, I think, again, maybe they did that later on where, where in one of the scenes we'll talk about the holodeck. They yes. reused the set as well. I think that could be just down to money as well, you know, just reusing sets and stuff, you know. I think it probably is because it yeah. must be costing a fortune to develop this show. It has to be, yeah. Must be multiple be. millions. I mean, you know, you go back 20 years ago and it was like getting on for a million pound per episode of the original oh, series. And this has yeah. got even better, higher production values. It's more like a film, is it now? Well, Discovery, I think, is up around 2 million per episode, 2 point something million. If yeah. I, you know. And you can really, most of that goes on the special effects, I think, because it's, it's some of the stuff they do on that show is up with movie standards. I oh, think. oh, absolutely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, obviously, Picard's very fond of this uh, boy, and uh, he uh, goes to meet with the uh, nuns, um, and this is where the uh, title of Absolute Candor actually comes from, because unlike any other Romulans, uh, these nuns believe in absolute candor, so you know they will be very truthful, very open, mm. um, and we'll find out more about the hist- about well, not about the history of it, but about who they are, what they do, because they do have a, a special place. Uh, so Picard uh, tells the boy that he's bought him a present, and it's the Three Musketeers by Alexander Alexandra uh, Dumas. This is obviously linking to the Next Generation. And the episode yeah. Hollow Pursuits with yeah. your favourite Reginald Barclay, Barclay, where he creates a hollow program um, with the bridge crew as the Three Musketeers. Yeah, I love that. I, I, again, that was great to see. You know, the the fall back again to to generations. You know, um, I was actually going to mention that later on in one of my Easter eggs about that episode with Barclay. Yeah, um, and even when you do it later on in the TV show. Uh, that episode the fourth the, the the episode we watched there's a couple of scenes where he's sword fighting and he takes the stance of uh of one of the musketeers you know it was great to see yes he does yeah it was good yeah. um again all small touches it's great you know it is it's, it's so well thought out as a show yeah um but there is another reference to the three musketeers in star trek and it's actually the original series on an episode called The Naked Time. Okay. 
where um, Spock refers to Sulu, uh, who's uh, wielding a sword as D'Artagnan. Because uh, if you remember on The Naked Time, it's where they uh, catch a virus which uh, removes their inhibitions and makes them act like, you know, they're absolutely, you know, dr- you know really drunk yes. sort of thing and start doing really stupid things. And one of the things is that uh, Sulu, obviously, he likes swordplay, which is also a nice cross-reference as well to the combat styles that he references um, on the 2009 Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Because you know when Kirk says to him, you know what, what's your combat? You know what combat skills are? Oh, sword fencing and it's sort of like you're bringing a sword to a face to fight kind of look. That's right. It was yeah. Sulu, yeah, and it was Riley or something, was it? Or one with the Irish accent? I think again we go back to it. Yeah, I think Riley. He. If I remember the episode. I'm trying to think about. It. I remember the Irish accent was very funny in that one as well. Yeah, yeah, it was. But uh, Riley, he was. He was sort of like the forerunner for Chekhov, wasn't That's he? That's really? right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a sh- and actually, that guy, he, he only died about a year ago. That's right, he's only really recently passed, actually. Yeah, such a shame, because I, I actually quite like the character of Riley, but there you go. I think Riley took over the engineering section or something, and he was on the Enterprise, and he was like. He locked them out, so the ship then was going to self destruct or something like that. I think. Yeah, and he, and he was uh, singing. He, he was singing. I can't remember. Was it Oh Danny Boy? Oh Danny Boy. Yeah. Yeah. And one more time. Time. The yeah. accent, but his accent wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't as wasn't as bad as uh, yeah. Rios's. So anyway. Uh, going back to the story, we've got a discussion about absolute candour and what that means, um, and uh, also some joking on about promises being prisons and all of that sort of stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, the boy's a little bit confused though about whether or not Picard actually likes him because uh, the uh, lead nun actually says, well, you know, Picard doesn't like children. And he said, oh, well, I thought you really liked me. And he said, no, no, I do like you. But we do know that, really, I think he, he got softer in the elder years because he kept on to the banner for Captain yeah. Picard Day. That was in his um, in his vault, wasn't it? And all of that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, because so. but in the episode where, where Captain Picard Day was done, he, he kind of wishes that they'd picked someone else to celebrate that day except for him, you know. Yeah. So they're, he definitely, I think he's gotten older. They're trying to show that he's softened towards. Maybe it's his lineage, lineage that he's lost his nephew who thought would carry the name on and stuff. You yes. Know? And he, he's kind of the last Picard, really, isn't he? If, if, we're, if we're right in saying that. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to his legacy. I think we talked about the last episode. Yeah. Um, where he's arrogant. Scott, he, like, I resign. He didn't think they'd take it. Maybe again, that leads into it, you know? Yeah, and uh, you know the uh, Admiral Clancy still thinks he's, you know, he's uh, he's hubris as she put yes, it, wasn't it? Hubris, yeah, so. yeah. And I think it's interesting actually looking at the story because we actually see a diff from Admiral Clancy a different point of view, which does sort of like question. Well, actually, is Picard really right to have took such a stance about the evacuation of Romulus if it would have? meant the falling of an entire federation. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those balancing morals, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, uh, w- w- the other thing about uh, Children of Picard is even right down to Encounter at Farpoint, where he, you know, says, you know, it doesn't allow children on the bridge of the Enterprise and then he yeah. allows Wesley on. You know, and we get all of the shut up, Wesley, <laughs> going on and stuff like that as well. That's I used, true. I used to hate Wesley Crusher, I really did. I didn't. I, I quite like, I always quite liked Wesley. He um he grew on me and I quite liked Wesley. I no, I, 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 never, I never liked him as a character because he was sort, sort of like a kid who knew more than the bridge crew yeah. who had, you know, done, you know, their future equivalent of degrees and gone yeah. through with the academy and stuff like that. It just didn't never sat well with me, to be honest, but there you go. Um, anyway, so uh, the sisters uh, who are called the uh, Kulat Milat. Yes. 
uh, helping the evacuation of 10,000 new refugees, uh, which references the Countdown comic book, which yes, you've correct. read. Yeah. And I think in the, in the comic, you don't really see them in the comic. Mm. So, and uh, this is kind of introducing some new canon really into the Star Trek universe, I think. This, um, new warrior nuns, you know? Yeah. Um, no, the book I listened to, I, the, it really goes into detail on, on, on them and, and a lot more information. But I quite like them, uh, the idea of them. Mm. They're, they're like the opposite, they're like the black to the white opposites, you know, to absolute candor, to keeping back your emotions, or it's a, it's a nice twist again, you know, on, on, on in the show. Yeah, they're, they're a very open part of the Romulan society, which is yeah. the absolute polar opposite of what the rest of the society is. And they're all female as well, which is quite interesting. Yes, yes, that's another interesting thing. Mm. So we then move on and the, the scene moves to a meal with Picard talking about the boy and will, you know, he will find a home for them. Yes. And then you uh, have like, uh, you know, the, the multiple scenes where uh, Picard's with the boys pretending to sword fight. Picard is reading The Three Musketeers. Elnor, who is the boy, uh, you know, he that's his name. He, he comes in later on. Uh, but the sword fighting you know, uh, that that he shows a lot of the styles is very much like in episodes like The Next Generation of uh, Cupid where Q puts the crew into an artificial reality based on Robin Hood and Picard is obviously Robin Hood and he has to rescue Maid Marion who was Vash. That's right. If you remember that. Yeah, and, I do, yeah. Yeah, and he also, refer- uh, he also fenced Guinan in the next generation, which was in the episode I Borg, when they were talking about Hugh. Yeah, the first time we see Hugh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, sword fencing's been on a lot on Star Trek one way it or is, the other. It, it is. It's a bit like um, the Shakespeare. and uh, They've a certain, there's, there's three or four things they've kind of run through all the show, I suppose. It, it kind of, yeah. again, builds the character of Picard, who he is really, you know. Yeah. Um, adventurer, swashbuckler, captain, you know, or how he sees himself or how, how, like how he wants to be on the open sea as well, you know, in so, some of the Star Trek movies Yeah, that we've seen. So, yeah, it was good that, again, like it's all, all the little details, you know, they make up, uh, they bring it together greatly. It's great. To do it. yeah and it, and to be honest it's it's quite a nice warm sort of scene with yeah. showing a bonding between Elner and Picard as well yeah because it's it's he's sort of like a surrogate granddad to him almost yeah. isn't he that's true so anyway while they're uh, doing the sword fighting which is just with sticks uh Picard is informed by Raffi that Mars is under attack yeah. uh, and then Picard has to leave and he tells uh, Zani, who is the uh, like lead nun, uh, that he says, I'm really sorry, I've got to go. This is happening. Uh, they have a bit of a talk about what will this mean for the uh, re- you know, the rescue effort. He says it, it'll all go on fine, and he says, Say goodbye to Elna for me as well. Uh, and then that's it. Then we cut back to modern day, and we're back to Rios now. So he's yeah. reading a book. The same book as from last week. Um, and uh, Girati joins him because she's bored. She's bored, yeah. Yeah. So she starts to mention that she has read the Journal of Theoretical Cybernetics, including <laughs> a fesh script for Professor Quok. Uh, you would never say that if you were inebriated. That's um, true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair play to you. Uh, she uh, evidently has been try- thinking about doing a, a hollow vid, but evidently the ship only has Klingon Opera on That's board. Right. <laughs> uh, so Klingon Opera obviously appeared across the next generation episodes like Gambit and uh, in DS9 as well. That's and right. it's normally used to reference how bad it is, but Worf loves it. And he would be on occasion caught singing some of it as well. Yeah. I like when she asks him why there's Klingon opera aboard. All he says is a long story. Yeah. He doesn't really say anything. He just says long story. So I'd love to find out why it is on board. Again, I have some theories about him later on. So Yeah, I, yeah. I must admit, I would love to find out about what it is yeah. with him as well. And I really liked 
their interaction together um the 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 two the two characters i thought there was good back and forth between them you know um yeah the acting the, and it was it was good you gave billy to the characters a bit more as well yeah well i mean she's talking about her dad yeah and then she asks him about what's your book about. So he says about the ex- existential pain of living <laughs> and consciousness of death. Yes. And uh, then Rafi comes in and she goes, oh, thank God. <laughs> 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 and uh, Rafi's all um, in a raffle about the fact that uh, they seem to be on a detour. And uh, she's informed by Rios, well, that's what Picard wanted. Yeah. Uh, and Rafi isn't happy. <laughs> To say no. the least. So, are you warming up to these characters, Eddie? Um, I'm still fifty-fifty on them. Um, the uh, more the more the captain know than Raffi. Raffi, I just for me the the Star Trek universe is all about you know helping each other and positivity and everything yeah i find raffi's her comments so cutting she's very negative she's very demeaning i don't know what it is but i don't think she fits the universe like it's mm. like the cursing it doesn't need to be there she doesn't need to be i just, just something about her i don't know no my theory later on about the captain uh, rios is rios sorry uh, right R- R- rios I, if my, I, I'm hoping I'm right on that because if it is, it'll actually, I actually make the character even better for me. Um, I, I have to admit, I do think it is an intriguing idea that you've had. I kind, I kind of go into it a bit more. I don't know if you've read it down further, but I go into a tiny bit more of my theory on it. What happens? Why? Why it's happening? I don't want to say it here now because I don't want to do any spoilers later yeah. on. You know? Yeah. No, I'm, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you yeah. say. I think it's a really interesting idea that you've got, though. Oh, I take that as a compliment from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we now cut to uh, the hollow deck, and yes. uh, the hollow deck is simulating uh, Picard's study from uh, scans uh, supplied by Zaban, and uh, there is a hospitality hologram uh, which came with the ship, and evidently Rios doesn't like it at all. Yeah. Uh, so the door chimes and then Picard says, come, as he does. And obviously referencing all of the times he said that about his ready room yeah, and stuff I, like that. Yeah, I spotted that as well. It's that, that come line is like the engage line really, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Well, I had to make it so, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they start discussing... Uh, so Rafi comes in. Um, she's angry. They're discussing free crowd. A free cloud, rather. Um, Rios is there as well. That's where you get the cursing line where I hate that fudging hologram. Yeah. Um, and then, so they're in the middle of talking about free cloud and about, you know, Picard's, you know, is he mental for not going straight to, you know, free cloud and going to uh, Vash- uh, Vashti first? Yeah. And. Uh, then Girati turns up and she says, is this a secret meeting or, a, or am I part of the queue, uh, the crew now? Yeah. Um, and Picard invites her in and lets her join the conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah. What did you think about that? I like this scene because, again, it goes back to when Picard used to, in the Ent- on the Enterprise, he used to like have all his number one and Deanna Troy and all of them used to come to him and he'd, he'd ask them their opinions and their questions and it, it kind of goes back to that and all of them coming together to, as a meet together to meet and chat about what to do you know and he'd ask them for their opinions and stuff I think it just it felt like that yeah again in the holodeck you know the conference room sort of effect yeah yeah, yeah. and the hospitality thing then I think is a real throwback to DS9 when we kind of first see that, I think it was Vic, Fon- Vic Fontaine. Yes. If I'm right. And that was the first time we ever really saw a hospitality hologram. Yeah. Um, And I thought that was a nice uh, throwback again to that, you know. But I mean, when, Vic, uh, sorry, go James, on. James Darren played him, wasn't it, or something? James something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a Vic Fontaine. And yeah. then um, uh, Rob's son uh hug out with him an awful lot after he was injured yeah. as well, didn't he? Um but 
It's it's an interesting notion because the only ship that we've actually ever seen that has uh, anybody who deals with hospitality before has been Voyager with Neelix. Yeah. And he wasn't part of the proper crew. No, he kind of... Neelix kind of just put himself in as, as uh, he just took on the role, or and then he took on the role as being chef and everything. Yeah, as you know, that's kind of what he did, like, and became a great character, really, in that show. Yeah. So they have a discussion about the dangers of the region, um, and there's lots of things about you know this was controlled by one faction; it's now controlled by another or whatever and it's established that there's a, a rogue Romulan warbird roaming the area uh, which was uh, a, which is controlled by Karkatana uh, a Karkata mm. uh, so Romulan warbirds obviously first introduced in the original series episode Balance of Terror uh, and as I said before that's the first time we ever see Romulans it was actually I think before we actually see Klingons. Yes. Um, and also it introduced Mark Leonard to the Star Trek universe, who later played Spock's father. That's right. On the episode Journey to Babel, as well as numerous other Next Generation um, episodes and also the original series movies as well. So, um, anyway, back to story. Rios yeah. didn't know uh, Picard was unfamiliar with the area. Rafi kind of like criticises Picard for wanting to pick up a uh, warrior nun, the uh, uh, Kewit Milat, and uh, obviously that's all part of the new canon because we never had those before. No. Uh, so we find out a bit more. They are skilled combat fighters and the most feared enemies of the Tal Shiar. So that's yeah. an interesting thing. Obviously Tal Shiar being the secret police that first appeared in Face of the Enemy, um, right. which I mentioned last week. Uh, so Picard says that they have uh, their own criteria for accepting missions, although he doesn't say what that is. We later find out to, uh, that it's, you know, hopeless causes, but uh, we don't find that out at that point. But if they think that a mis- uh, his mission is unworthy, they would tell him in accordance with absolute candor. That's right. Uh, so Rafi and Picard discuss uh, the past and... Evidently, what they used to say, and you'll be able to confirm if this is in the comics or not, but one impossible thing at a time. Yeah. Yeah. You actually, see in the book that I listened to, you actually, there's a lot of that kind of stuff in it as well, you know? Yeah. Um, well, don't ruin the book too much, because I want to... No, I won't. I, I'm not going to give... I, I put wrote down one or two notes, but I'm not going to give too much of it away, the plot, because there's, there's characters appear in the book that I don't know will they appear in the show. I, I hope one does, but we we'll mm. leave that there. Okay. So anyway, Picard being Picard, he refuses to change his mind. Um, and then he says, right, I'm going to, I'll be in my quarters. Uh, just as Jurati sort of like closes this sort of scene by saying, does any, everybody else think that absolute candor sounds potentially annoying? <laughs> yeah, that was a good line. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so we cut over to the Borg Cube and uh, Sudge is uh, reviewing the interview with uh, Ramda before the assimilation and using Romulan tarot cards as well. She's using those. And yeah. Ramda is saying, when all the shackled demons break their chains and answer the call of the destroyer. So what this has got me thinking is, if Sudge is the destroyer, yeah. Are the A five hundred units like F eight or Fate? Yeah. Um, the attacked okay. Mars. Are they the shackled? Maybe. And, That's interesting. Yeah. And uh, could synthetics exist a thousand years ago with the Romulan Vulcan sort of split, which we talked about last week as well, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. <coughs> so that seems really, really short. Yeah, um, it's an interesting one though. Yeah, but I, I just thought it was because of that line. I thought. How how should you interpret that? And that just seemed to me to be the way it it would be interpreted. Yeah, shackled, shackled demons. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, back to the ship and uh, the Rat Vest, uh, Vesti and the Romulan planet defence system of killer uh, drones um, is circling the planet, So which wasn't there before, and they need clearance. Now, I don't know if you picked up this, but when I was looking, I thought... It looks like a green version of the Tholian web. Yeah. 
um, surrounding the planet. Now, if you don't know what the Tholian web is or who the Tholians are, they're an alien species which basically uh, their um, weapons is to surround other ships with uh, a web of energy beams which is sort of like knit around. It's not a very effective weapon because it takes absolutely ages for them to do it. In a matter of fact, uh, the original Enterprise escapes thoroughly in Web in about 49 minutes out of the 50-minute episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, it's an interesting sort of concept. Anyway, Picard says, tell Central Station that it's him. You know, quite cocksure of himself, really, there, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And, again. and Raffi says that they've done that, and the Romulans weren't impressed. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Rios suggests that, well, maybe a bribe would be in order. And this is where, this is sort of like linking to a completely different show. But what this this whole Picard experience on Vesti sort of reminds me of is the polar opposite of Jane's world in Firefly. Right. Have you ever seen Firefly? Oh, I have, yeah. I love Firefly. Yeah. And I've seen the movie as well, Serenity. Serenity. That show got cancelled way too early. Oh, yeah. They, they keep saying it's going to come back, but... No, you know. no, they won't. And unfortunately, the uh, the preacher on there, he's since passed. He's passed, yeah. yeah. But um, in terms of that Jane's World episode, um, the character of Jane, he... Uh, he was frightened about going to this planet because he left there and he thought that everybody would be after him, but everybody's worshipping him like a hero. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which is the polar opposite, where Picard thinks everybody's going to be worshipping him like a hero and no one's impressed by him. True. So it's interesting. So we... Well, I suppose it goes back as well to when... The, the broken promises that the the warrior nun spoke about. He, the last thing he said was, "I promise to return." Yes. And it's now fourteen years later, and he's only returning. So again, to me, technically, it's a broken promise, which they spoke about. You know. Well, I think technically speaking, I don't think he has broke his promise because he never said when. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Do it on the technical. <laughs> If it had said, I'll be back next week, that would have been a broken promise. But again, don't forget that uh, the uh, the nuns don't believe in promises. Yeah. Because it's, you know, you're not jailing people by putting them in a the, in the promise. That's right. Uh, so anyway, on Vestry, Picard beams down and um, wishes everybody Joel and True, you know. Yeah. Hello, basically. And this is interesting because his outfit is black. With like where, but it looks like his uh, season seven uh, outfit that he had on a lot of those uh, shows where it's sort of like that ja that term, sort of like jacket, yeah. and uh, the shoulder areas rather than having the command red, are like a black leather. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. Uh, for me, it was like a nod to how life has changed since he's left Starfleet. He's still, you know, he's kind of a bit sad over it maybe or the way it's turned out for him. He still has the uniform, but it's all in black, you know? Yeah. Technically. I quite like that little touch again. Yeah, and I, I think obviously not having the red is sort of like, yeah. again, done it, uh, you know, uh, reinforcing the fact that he he doesn't have a rank. But the, the funny thing was in the black outfit, he actually looked very small. You know, black is, as they say, is slimming. Yeah. But he looked quite scrawny. He looked, he looked kind of frail in it as well. I think. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Which was, you know, so I liked it. It was, it was a nice uniform. It was a nice look. Yeah, I liked it as well. It's good. It's better than the men from Del Monte. <laughs> but, but he says yes. Um, anyway, the the there is a bar there as well, and uh, people are sat outside the uh, inside the bar. Well, on the outside of the bar, rather, you know, like the patio area. Yeah. Uh, but there's a sign that's saying no humans. So you can see there's animosity towards humans uh, here. So we then cut to the monastery and Picard uh, greets Zani and he asks uh, for her help. Uh, just as Elnor arrives and he's surprised by Picard being there. Um, yes. Elnor is now a grown man rather than being a young boy. That's true. Um, and then we cut over to the Borg Cube. Now, Soji and Narek are 
talking about Ramda, who was on a medical bed. She's saying that, you know, she's drawn to Ramda Mm -hmm. um, for some reason. And she's holding a hand while Ramda's unconscious. Yeah. Uh, And then there's this medical droid that's floating around and scanning Ramda as well. And if if you notice that, it looked a bit... I did, yeah. It looked a bit weird, didn't it, really? But uh, anyway, the scene progresses into uh, a mess hall with Soji and Narek talking. And she asks him, are you a member of the Tal Shiar? Because you don't wear insignia you don't have a rank you know but you can go anywhere you like he can go anywhere you want yeah. yeah um to which he says no and then she says but if you were tell she are would you still say no and he says yes yes yeah <laughs> which to be fair that didn't really answer a question because yeah. um you know it's pretty obvious that if he was tell she are he would still say no i'm not tell she are yeah so by agreeing, you know, all he's done is confirm what what he would have done if he'd have been Tal Shiar. Does it mean he is Tal Shiar? And again, I don't think he is because I, don't think, he is I think he's the previous cabal that is a front for Tal Shiar. So he uh, takes her to see a Borg ritual or to, t- to undertake a Borg ritual. And she said, but they don't have them. And he said, well, yes, they do, actually. So... What we do find out in the conversation that goes on while I walk into this place is that we find out that uh, Soji must have learned Romulan about 2396 uh, at yeah. the uh, university, we well, presumed that the year was university, by her professor. Um, and the current year is 2399 in the show. Yeah. So Narek jokes with Soji about the ritual and then just suddenly starts skidding down this corridor because he says, take your shoes off. And then he starts making this sort of sound and then mm. runs down the corridor and skids along. So they're just both having fun, messing about, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then they have like um, a romantic sort of moment. And he quizzes her about her being on board the ship, the Ellison. Yes. which was a few years before when she uh, shipped out to the Beta Quadrant. And he said, Terran records are, you know, it, this is shocking by Romulan standards, but they're a ma- the travel records are a matter of public record. Yeah. And he says, and there was no record of you on that ship. And she says, are you spying with me, or on me? Um, which, uh, and she says to hell with him so he turns around to her and says so you said to hell with the Romulan files as well because yeah. obviously he's holding that over a barrel and he's sort of like saying um, you know she said what are you doing she said I'm f- uh, he says I'm f- uh, feeding an insatiable curiosity as a you so and that's like planting that seed of doubt in her head about yeah. stuff which is referenced shortly uh, but here's an interesting one. The reference to the Ellison, which is a ship we've never heard of. It's a possible Easter egg, which may be a tribute to Harlan Ellison. Harlan Ellison was a writer for the original series, and he wrote what most people consider to be the quintessential episode of the original series, which is City on the Edge of Forever, where Kirk and Spock use a guardian of forever to travel back in time to rescue McCoy and stop him from changing the future, which results in a net federation never having happened. Yeah. And uh, in doing so, Kirk falls in love with Edith Keener, played by John Collins, uh, who was basically the linchpin which stopped America from joining the Second World War and basically the Nazis winning, as it were. So she had to die in order for their future to still be intact. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, Ellison, he passed away in 2018, uh, did the, uh, you know, the, the screenwriter for Star Trek. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame. <clears throat> anyway, cut back to La Serena and... Uh, Picard has uh, been identified and he's in danger and Rafi calls him but he says no I need more time sort of thing so we, we cut down to the monastery and Picard's talking to Zani and um, Elder offers Picard food and he says oh not now and he drops it and then goes off sulking 
So it's sort of like, you know... He, he, petulant. Yeah, he's quite petulant, yeah. isn't he? Uh, Picard and Zani discuss his mission and Elder's training. He's been trained uh, as in the ways of the nun, but he can never be one of them because he's male. Um, and she suggests that Elder uh, joins Picard because, you know, it'd be appropriate for his quest. Picard asks if she's sure because he may die. You know, he's very concerned about that. Yeah. And she says, well, at least he will have lived before he dies. Yeah, I like this scene now as well. And also, I think it goes back to the philosophy of the, the warriors and the that they can't be bought. They have to choose yeah. to accept the mission that it has to be. They have to want to do it. You know, it has to be something for them. So it was, it was a nice kind of add on again to the canon and the building that their their story you know yeah and it also sort of like establishes how dangerous this mission actually is for picard yeah. because they will only accept lost causes yeah so you know it's interesting because up until a little bit of threat from you know some romulans operating on earth we've never really got a feel for how much danger could this actually be yeah um which is which is interesting because i thought why haven't they played that up more on the show up until now? Why drop this yeah. at this point? True. So anyway, Picard asks for... Uh, so cut to Picard and Elder. Uh, Picard asks for his help on the mission uh, as a uh, quart millat. Yeah. And uh, basically he tells him about Data, Daj and his mission. There's talk about... Uh, Data's cat spot, which obviously appeared on lots of episodes of the original series, but also on Generations as well. Um, Elder asks why Picard needs him, and he says because he's young, he's strong, and he's one of the best fighters that Zani's ever seen, plus yeah. the quest meets the criteria. And Elder refuses again, being quite petulant, saying, uh, you know, he walks off angry, saying, you left me, and it's, you know, and now it's only because I'm interest of interest to you or used to you that you you want to know me. So I can see no reason why I can't just you know um, leave you now and walks off. Yeah. So we then cut outside to the Romulan bar where Picard is now. You know he's left the monastery. He's going back, and he's told he's got seven minutes before he can be beamed up because of this defense grid. Uh, so Picard goes up to the sign uh, that says no humans and he tears it down and enters the bar. He greets everybody with a Joel and true and sits down. Everyone's sort of staring at him. He's obviously aware of this. Um, a waiter goes by and ignores him, even though he's call uh, Picard's calling him over. Yeah. And then, right, now this is an awful pronunciation. Gatenquem <laughs> Adrev. Well said approaches him and says he knows uh, who he is. And in a previous life, when he was a Romulan senator, he was present when Picard gave his address at the Romulan Hall of State to help the Romulans ev evacuate. Picard says, I'm sorry, I just I don't remember you. And um, Tenquam says... Uh, about how touched he was by his speech when he came back and he heard that he had the great uh, Wallenberg class transports. Now, Wallenberg class ships have never been seen on Star Trek and they're oh. new to Picard, but it's likely that Wallenberg is named after the Swedish diplomat Rael Wallenberg, who saved tens of thousands of Jewish people in Hungary during the Second World War. Uh, the evacuation uh, uh, Kuat Milat uh, helped Picard with obviously saved tens of thousands of Romulans. Yeah. And uh, Wallenberg, a hero story, was filmed in 1985 and overseen by Rick Berman, who was executive producer for The Next Generation, DS9, Voyager and Enterprise. Yeah. So I thought that was quite a nice little link. Yeah. Um, then... Uh, Tenquam says that they're on, uh, they all got on a Nightingale five generations of Romulans and they were brought here. Now, again, Nightingale, Florence Nightingale, is obviously a possible reference, but also reference back to a Voyager episode 
called Nightingale, uh, basically the same name, where Harry Kim rescues a crippled ship, alien ship, which he calls Nightingale, when the Kralor, who own the ship, ask him to command a ship to transport vaccines to the home planet, but he is deceived and is transported technology in violation of the Prime Directive. In absolute candour, the Romulans believed that they were uh, Picard deceived them and took advantage of them at their time of need. So it's yeah. sort of like a, a flip in terms of, you know, the Nightingale, you know, um, in terms of the way that, that that works there, you know, w- one where the Starfleet was deceiving and then the other one where the Romulans believed that Starfleet was deceiving. So uh, quite a nice little flip. Uh, Romulans yeah. criticise Picard for giving up um, and he's basically surrounded and um, Romulan says Starfleet tried to confuse Romulans at the time of need and scatter them not thinking about Romulan ingenuity and Picard forced to uh, was then forced to fence uh, this Romulan senator uh, but he threw down his sword uh, which is a role reversal going back to the Next Generation episode of Hollow Pursuits, where when Riker goes into Barclay's uh, simulation, the Picard musketeer challenged Riker to a fencing duel, saying, do I detect a streak of yellow along that good fellow's (laughs) back? Which I thought was quite a nice little thing. So uh, Elmer then says to uh, Tenquim, uh, choose to live because he's appeared. Um, and uh, they go to attack Picard and Elna kills them um, and then he says to the senator's you know, um, disembodied uh, head uh, that, you know, he regrets his choice. Yeah, I like this scene as well because they showed the green blood Yes, yeah. As they, as they cut, which we know is the Romulans and the Vulcans share that by a lot of the kind of blood because of the um they have they don't have iron no they're based on copper isn't it copper. yeah i think it is yeah, yeah. so it's, it's yeah so it was a nice thing again to add in you know to see the neck as it came off green blood so i thought that was a good part yes because occasionally they get it wrong and like they don't do yeah. purple blood for klingons they do red blood yeah which always annoys me a little bit uh but anyway so picard you know says to everybody look you know i brought faith with you and says that he's sorry and then the mob's just about to start to get angry and they're beamed up before they can be shot. Yeah. So on board the ship, Picard grabs Elna and says, you know, he's not to kill anyone without Picard's say so. Um, it, Picard's furious at this point. Elna apologises. And then we, this is where we actually find that the Kuwat Milat only signed themselves up to lost causes. That's right. Cut back to the Borg cube, and we've now got Wizzo, uh, sorry, Rizzo na- uh, waking Narek. Narek asks about uh, Ramda and her ship. Rizzo's unimpressed by Narek's lack of uh, progress um, and planting one seed of uh, doubt, you know, in the amount of time he's had. And uh, she suggests that Soji may be actually controlling Narek rather than the other way mm. around. Uh, Rizzo threatens Narek, choking him, and uh, makes him admit that you know um, that Soji is the Seb Cheneb, or the Destroyer, and uh, she gives Narek one week to get the location of the uh, nest of AIs, or she will resort to, as she puts it, good old-fashioned pain and violence. Pain and violence, yeah. <laughs> Which I love the way of putting that, because it really does yeah. establish her character. So back to Picard on the ship and uh, they're in combat with a Romulan warbird. This is actually the exact same type of warbird that is first seen on the uh, the original series, The Balance of Terror. Uh, So they're being forced into the planetary system by this warbird and uh, obviously Ryos says we can't outrun them but we can outfly them. You get the emergency tactical hologram. Or yeah. uh, they called him Emmett, didn't they? That's right. Which uh, I thought, you know, is that an abbreviation for emergency tactical? Yeah. Um, he was quite a good character, actually. Yeah, Spanish in sort yeah. of origin, as it were. Very laid back, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, the other ship um, 
is uh, damaged in a fight. Oh, sorry, another ship appears, which you know helps to disable the warbird. Uh, and then Raffi says that the other ship's hailing them, um, and he he says, you know, uh, answer it sort of thing, and then realizes that he's not the captain and looks at, uh, you know, Rios, um, and he says, you know, do it and all of that, and then uh, they end up beaming the character over, and it's yeah. seven of nine. <laughs> Hooray! We get to it's see a great her. Moment. It was yeah. a great moment. Uh, and obviously, Seven of Nine and Picard know of each other. Whether or not they've had a previous history, we don't know, but they, we, don't we know definitely yet. know yeah. that they know of each other. Uh, and she says, you owe me a shit, Picard, and fades. Yeah. And then that is the end of uh, the episode. But obviously, Seven of Nine, she was first introduced, and I think it was season four, if I remember four. rightly, That's of right. Voyager. Uh, in the uh, episode Scorpion Part 1 and 2, and her full designation was 7 of 9 tertiary adjunct of Unimatrix 01. Yeah. Um, so she w- was obviously separate from the Borg Collective and uh, became an individual, as, the, as you do yeah. in Star Trek. Yeah. So. So that's the entire episode. Well done. Yeah. It was a long, a long recap. It was a long recap, but uh, there was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot in it because <coughs> I don't know about you, but I was watching it. I think not much happened. Yeah, that's a, yeah. I said the same too. I said I watched the first time. Yeah, and and I was like, oh, this will, this uh, there's not much happening. But when you go back, watch second, third, and you break it down, there's a lot of little details in it. So little things happening are kind of giving you more information about the uh, some answers, kind of about the Romulans and. You get to see a space bottle and you know little things like that. You know there was there was a lot more than I thought. Mm. I uh, overall as an episode, how did you rate it so far? I think in terms of performance, it's been Patrick Stewart's best acting. Yes, I agree with you there. I think um, you know he portrayed a um, much warmer Picard, especially in the fourteen-year previous sort of history. So, and on that, do you think that's down to the director of this episode? I think it, because we are, because we know it was what Frex. Yeah, it was Jonathan Frex. Yeah, and the last time they worked together was ninety nine, ninety eight, or around that time, you know. So I mean, he's definitely he's he directed a good few generation episodes, and uh, he wrote a, he's done a lot of script work, a lot of stuff for movies and things as well. He really knows the character Picard, so maybe he knew how to get the best out of. Yeah, and obviously the familiarity with Patrick Stewart yeah. as well. That's what I'm saying. You know how to get the best out of Patrick Stewart. Like. Yeah, so. I, th- I think that that's a strong possibility. I think that's a yeah. very strong possibility. But also, I think that the story was um, more about relationships, yeah. whereas the the first sort because this is, this is like in three chapters evidently this series um yeah. and this chapter being like only a couple of chapters evidently a couple of episodes yeah. but in terms of the first chapter i think that that was very much a reestablishing the law reestablishing where picard is mm. but not really showing you um that human sort of aspect of picard yeah but, yeah i but i think no they've had four episodes of storytelling and world building mm. and adding new canon to the universe and a few new characters that the next one or two now really need to push it on and get a bit of action and you know get get a you know really get into it now i think yeah um because if the next one is i won't say slow but if the next one again is a current a more methodical world building episode it's going to lose people you know mm. i think no, for me personally, the Alison Phil, she plays Dr. Duras. I think she's the best character in the show for some reason. I really like her, but she's not getting much screen time. It's kind of just little snippets. I really like her. I think she's an interesting character. And there's something, you know, secretive hidden there, as we both kind of will probably speak about later on in a minute. Yeah. Um, as an episode, I enjoyed it more than last week's one. Um, definitely. And it it was a good episode. I enjoyed it. I give it a solid four out of five, you know. Mm. Um, and again, it it didn't. I wasn't bored watching that. I mean, you're you're the same. We were, we were watching these episodes two or three times in the one day, the two of us. I think. Yeah. 
because we're we're we're, we're kind of mess- and messaging back and forward all the time it's just <laughs> because we keep we keep spotting something new and you spot something I spot something yeah um, or oh, you'll come up with an idea and then I'll come up with yeah. something that'll <laughs> complement it and stuff like that because yeah, we were exactly. we were talking about you know the possibility of um, like the Romulans putting something in there. Uh, DNA that they couldn't. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my theories. My World War Z, Z theories. I call it later on. I'm going to talk about that now in a minute. We kind of spoke a lot about the Easter eggs. The good thing about you is you spotted you always spot a lot of the stuff, and you put it into the the, the recaps. Like you spotted the Wallenberg one about the uh, helping the Jews during the war. I actually spotted that as well. Yeah, uh, I because I recognize the name because I, I actually like history. I watched his channel a lot. Um, and the Barkley one again with the Musketeers. So we're kind of spotting the same things. I really like the fact that you're going to detail with the books and stuff and explaining that stuff. It's great, you mm-hmm. know, seeing that side of it. Um, you know, it's, it, it, there wasn't massive amount of Easter eggs in this, I suppose. What do you think? I, I, I don't know. I think I picked out quite a few. <laughs> yeah, there was a few <coughs> compared to other episodes. Yeah. I think, you know, it was all... There was a... If you think back to the first episode one and two, you, you we were picking out twenty thirty Easter eggs with the hat on the, on uh, behind them, and you know there was certain uh, the books on the tables, and this one was more about I think cannon building the new. I, I would completely characters. agree, but I mean, yeah. if if you remember on that first episode, I I did say I think that the number of um, Easter yeah, eggs is going to going to dissipate over time. It has to really Yeah, it, because yeah. otherwise all that you're doing is just cross-referencing previous episodes over and over and over again and it's going to get people bored. You've... Well, it's only... Yeah, there's only so much fandom you can pander to, really, I suppose, the Star Trek fandom, like what they're... You know? Yeah. So, we saw what it did to Star Wars. Cough, cough, we won't talk about no. that. Um, um, but no, overall a good episode. Um, again, like I said, my favourite scene was when they were all um, in his ready room. I won't say ready room, but they were all inside in his the holodeck. And they were in like, the observation lounge and they were all sitting around and he was asking them for suggestions. Mm. I liked that moment. It kind of harkened back to heaven. Number one and Diana and Beverly Crusher and Worf. Uh, they say all of them kind of sitting around, you know, and him at the front of the table. Yeah. And then they come when he said that as the door opened and stuff. You know, it was good. I like those moments. They give you kind of, they're like the kind of engaged goosebump moments. You yeah, know? yeah. No, no, exactly um, what you mean. Um, I just talk quickly there about the book that I just finished. Yeah, sure. No, it's an audio book, so you don't read an audio book. You listen to it. So I listened to it on my runs and stuff. I had a race this week weekend, as you know. Um, so I listened to it during that most of it. Um. It's called, I know, Star Trek Picard, The Last Best Hope. It was only released in February the 10th or 11th, and it's by Una McCormack. She's done a few other books as well in the series, um, if you want to Google her. Um, she's actually pretty much prolific Star Trek writer, I think. Mm. She, she, she's a good school theorist. It covers the period between 2381 to 2385, the events leading up to the supernova and Picard's resignation, resignation from Starfleet. No, I'm not going to give too much away about it, but it was a, for me it was very fast paced. It gave kind of great background and little tidbits, good info on the on the old TNG crew where they were and what happened mm-hmm. to them, as well, which was very good. I actually really enjoyed that, um, and where they kind of end up, um, and the journey it took I found very interesting. Um, it's a it's basically about the political wranglings of the Federation Council versus Starfleet versus. A distrustful enemy, which is um, the Romulans, obviously. Um, and should they help them? Shouldn't they help them? Help them? Um, the, it's kind of about the new Starfleet is a younger Starfleet now, you know, and how they don't really, you know, they think different to the older, like the Picard Starfleet and what that was about as well. Yeah. Um, so it's very good, I have to say. No, and it goes a lot more into the nuns. Warrior Nun. I love that Warrior Nuns. That that's great. Like Warrior Nun. It just has a great name. Feel to it. Mm. Um, so again, it's called Star Trek: Picard: The Last Best Hope. It's just released, lads. Um, if you want an audio book, it's it's very good. Um, or if you like the the physical copies, which I know you like, Hayden. Sometimes, um, 
It's definitely it's a good listen. It's not a very long listen. It's cup four, you know. But it's, good. it's eleven hours. That's not very long for an audiobook. For, for no, like, so that's much, true. But when you, like, when you do that in two days, you know, if you're if you're working, you have your headphones in and like a Bluetooth speaker at work and stuff. Yeah, I do anyway. So, but uh, but when you were uh, you know when you consider that a lot of the Star Trek books are abridged ones, so they're about yeah. three or four hours. You know, yeah. an eleven hour book is great. Yeah, yeah, I suppose yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice time. And the, the person doing the reading is very nice. To I actually don't know who. I must Google to see who who, who read it. It's a great voice. Um, it's you know does the characters very well. And again, if you think of it this way, the comic is the abbreviation. Various is kind of like the, the the notes, really, and the book is the full, the full history. Mm. So it's good. The two of them together is good, and there's a good bit of Raffi in it as well. She's actually nicer in the book than she is in the show. <laughs> so, do you think it's more the actress that you're? Not... It's the actress. I think. I think it's. I think it's the actress. And again, you can't play the actress because she's been told how to play the character. I think because usually lots of them are told how to give the lines and how to play the character. I just find her very snarky. It does. She at the moment she's not suiting the Star Trek universe. Mm. Again, that might change. Maybe that's the way they want to play her. Again, you know, it's a new. It's a new fans coming to the show as well, you know. Yeah. So new people coming, like we're old school. So it was good. Um, that's all the Easter eggs, really. I've seen. We, we kind of spoke about most of them. I like the holodeck one, like we spoke about. Um, the green blood, I thought was a great twist. The holodeck was lovely again to see that in the show. Um, and a little, you know. So yeah, good episode. Looking forward to the one in two days' time. <laughs> yes, not long, not long to wait at all, is it? Yeah. It come, I think because we spent so long kind of talking about it for the days after, which we do. I mean, we were only talking about it up till yesterday, I think, were we? Yeah. Back and forward. And we spend a good hour some nights back and forward to each other about it. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's great. Like, it's really... I was always a Star Trek fan, not to your level, obviously. And I'm sure to some of Steve's level or some of the people that listen to this show's level. But um, I'm going back. Like we got the hum. You sent me the link for the hum- humble bungle, all the comics, and you're getting new books. We're well, both of us started jumping back in feet first again to all the old stuff. You yeah, know? I mean, I must admit, you know, for for me, Star Trek. Um, I've I've always loved Star Trek. You know, my my yes, I I can't that. remember not knowing about Star Trek. I can't re- I can remember mm. not knowing about Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, because I remember the anticipation waiting for that to come to the cinema, whereas because it was yeah. on TV, it's pretty, it probably Star Trek probably just sort of like slowly integrated its way into my life. Yeah. I mean, my mum and dad, you know, they used to be great Star Trek fans uh, when they were oh, when they were alive. Not anywhere near to the extent that I am, but my mum and dad would often tell me the stories about before I was born when t- Star Trek was first syndicated on the BBC, that right. uh, what they would do is they would go to Middlesbrough to do the shop because they lived in a place called Stortsea. They go, they go to, <laughs> would go to Middlesbrough to do the shopping, come home, drop all the shopping off, watch Star Trek on the Saturday night, and then go yeah. to the cinema afterwards. You know, that used to be like oh, like their life when, <laughs> before me. Um, so... So that's where, you, but that's where you get your passion for, didn't you? See, they lit the match. Yeah, um, lit the fire, like yeah, and got and built the. Field. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember going to see two thousand and one when I was about six. Yeah. You know, it, it's uh, all of these old uh, classics being just uh, yeah, so my, exposed about with them all the time. Yeah, my first movie was Superman, age six. Yeah. So um, yeah, that had a massive like how you are with Star Trek. That's how I am with Superman. Mm. I'm a huge Superman nerd. So I'm a bit of a super bad nerd myself as well. <laughs> oh well, uh, we might do a show on that someday. So, on 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 the, the what they've done to him at the moment. Yeah, which is just painful. Yeah, it is. But well, thank God for the DC um, TV series. Our reverse. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, um, do you want to go into our theories now, or what? Do yeah, you do you want to you want to talk about uh, where you are in terms of your theory about where everything is? Yeah, I'm. I'm like, this is the first time. No, I've got so many theories. I kind of went, for an episode that I had nothing. I've actually got a lot out of it. Um, um, let me get down now to here. Sorry, know about this. Here we go. Yeah, theories. 
Easter eggs we've done theories. Um, I think we both had the, or the theory that maybe Doctor Zrat is an android. Yes, I think they were both on, and it, just certain ways she moves and the way she talks and stuff. She could be an android. Do you, you know, know what made me think she was an android as well? Was actually yeah. something that Kate. This was, I think, this was the first time I actually thought it when I saw the episode. And she's talking to Rios, and she said that she'd read what she had read, including yeah. like you know, like the collective works by Professor Quan. And I yeah. was thinking. They're either on a heck of a long journey, or this is a very slow ship, or both, or she reads superhumanly fast. Yeah. And that's what made me think, hang on a minute. <laughs> so I got, that's how I got there. Yeah. So the other thing with her, and it was kind of you put the idea in my head, like you think that she's a spy or she's working with O or something. Oh, you definitely, know? yeah. In, yeah, in, in so I went back and I was looking at episodes and stuff, and in one of the episodes, she says the line, those damn Romulans just blew away, blew away, Dash. Now, if you look at it, Picard's reaction to her comment, he he actually never said that to her. He kind of takes a deep breath and just nods. And he never actually said to her the how, how Dash died, if you go back and look at it. How, so how did she know mm. that? Now, it could be just an editing error or something. So maybe that's why he, he's so willing to help her and takes her onto the ship without um, Rafa doing a, a, a security check on her, remember? Yeah, and that, that's that's that a good line. catch because that's what I hadn't caught. Oh, didn't you actually got something no, that he hadn't caught? Uh, yeah, you got, yeah, you got well, something that I hadn't caught. <laughs> lads, if you're listening to this, someone clip that <laughs> and, and send the, we, that needs to be put up on the Facebook page. Yeah. Oh, sure, that's the grand name. After catching the head, no, there, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you, so you're you, a you teensy bit starstruck there, aren't you now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, to be sure. That, that's going to continue forever. So I think. Uh, yeah, that's I think we're going to be saying that quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, go on. Yeah. Right, so to continue the Jurassic, the Jur- I can never pronounce her name, Jurassi thing, when Odin comes to see her, um, this also supports my robot theory. Um, what if she... Because we never really see what happens between them. So what if Jurati realizes that O is working for the Tal Chiara and knows who she is and she's after killing O, you know? Mm. And then she ran off to the ship to Picard as well. So, uh, you know, and then my other one is with Jurati is what... Because we were down the line of the, the sunglasses, remember? Yeah. Why they were there. Um, and maybe Jurassic, maybe Commander Rowe is actually Jurassic, you know, maybe she's took to this, maybe she killed Jurassic and now she's after replacing her with some sort of face technology, which they used, Cisco used in Deep Space Nine, if I remember correctly. And the sunglasses were used for scanning her face. Yeah. You know? So she can and I quite like that one. Maybe it would be interesting if, if that's how all kind of infiltrates the ship and stuff and keeps an eye on the card and keeps an eye on what they're doing, you know? Yeah, but I'm trying to remember uh, which sci-fi show actually used that quite a bit. And I'm, for some reason, I've got Red Dwarf running in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, I suppose you could kind of call it the Mission Impossible theory, really, couldn't you? Uh, yeah. Like, the, you know, um, but they use kind of uh, hologram actually, technology. I just realized to... it's the Flash. Oh, you're right, actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's the Flash yes. that uses that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, I just thought they're kind of all my Dr. Zerati theories, which is quite a lot of them, yeah. really. So one of them might have to be right, I suppose. But uh, the law of averages. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing what you, what you do. What you I've been, accused, like, what, what, what I've been yeah. accused of doing. <laughs> I said, I better jump on board and give 100 theories. The, the, the 10% rule, yeah. you know. Give ten, give ten, and one has to yeah. be right. Um, so then I have my Q theory, which I still, I'm, I still think Q could be involved somewhere because of the five queens that we saw in at the start of the, the very first episode. It was pretty much the first shot of the Picard series, really, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Um, the dream sequence, um, as we know, when uh, Q puts humanity on trial. He kind of the last thing he warned them when when that episode he said uh, the trial never ends, 
So maybe he's going to return for this one last te- test to help to help Picard finally beat the Borg because it really has been his greatest enemy. I think personally, it's his greatest enemy through his career. It has been the Borg, you know. Mm. Um, and maybe this that dream sequence was Q using Data as a memory to send them on the right track or the right direction. You know, we know how tricky Q can be. Um, I quite like that theory. I would like you to be in it somehow, you know. I'm. I have to admit, I'm not sure we're going to see Q anymore. No, oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. He was such a great character. I love Q as a character. He was definitely um, my favourite one out of all of the sort of bad yeah. guys, but not really. Yeah. So that's those theories. Um, and my other thing. Let me think now. Hence. Do you, we spoke about my World War Z theory that um, the Romulans had encountered the Borg thousands of years, thousands of years ago, and the Borg first tried to assimilate them, and as we know from the World War Z movie, with the zombies didn't attack anybody that had a, a kind of a lethal virus or they had something wrong with them or whatever. Mm-hmm. So my thought was maybe the Romulans have some sort of deficiency or something wrong in their system. That when the Borg tried to assimilate them, it, it you know it, it affects them, and hence that's why the current Borg ship cube they have has um, broken down or, or or you know disconnected from the from the collective. So yeah, but um, I'm not so sure on that one, and that's the reason why I say no. that is because when you look at the next generation, the not, sorry, next generation Voyager, <coughs> they actually had. Romulans that had been assimilated, um, yeah. you know, on there. But that's not to say that, you know, when you uh, talk... I've forgotten what the name of the secret organisation is now. It's just completely gone out of my head. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the one that's supposed to be the front for um, the the Tal Shia... Oh, the Tal Shia is the front for. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to annoy me now because I can't remember what that name is. Uh, the... The uh, Vash, whatever it was. The Zat Vash, is it? Yeah, Zat Vash, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, could they have, uh, members of the Zad Vash, be, you know, have something change in the DNA sequence which makes them from being unassimilatable? Yeah, because of their fear of, of technology. Uh, yeah, so that, 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 sense, then, yeah. Fee, that then allows Voyager to have uh, a... Um, a Romulan as, yeah. you know, as a Borg or as a, you know, a Borg that has, uh, you know, been separated from the collective, which was what the episode was yeah. about. And it also allows for what happened to happen as well. So it yeah. sort of like supports both sides of our, you know, of, of where we're coming from on I that one theory. There's, 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 there's definitely something there with what happened, the Borg trying to simulate that ship. Yeah. So I think we'll find that out maybe next week or two anyway. Um, again, you know, another theory that I just had. Now, I think we both, we both I kind of was saying when we were chatting that 7 and 9 was part of, I have to pronounce this now, the Fenris Rangers, yep. which used to protect the, the Vashti sector. And I think that's what she used to do when she left Voyager. Yep. You know, so, and, and she still kind of, protecting the the vast the sector and that's why we see her attacking the ship and trying to help out i think you've pretty much confirmed that if i if i, I saw something i was reading that she was talking about it jerry ryan the, yes. the actress that, yeah. that, that posted that she was a ranger so i didn't see that at the time but now i i, I had i had seen i'd, it, I'd so. heard that she was in some form of protectorate kind of role yeah. but what that was uh I couldn't. I couldn't remember. So I think. It, I'm I sure think we'll find this. out a lot more. Next I think it'll be that. Yeah. 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 So I have two more theories out there. Now this is the one I really like, and I hope I'm right in it. And it's out there. And for me, I think it's possible that Rios, Captain Rios, is actually a hologram as well. I think the whole ship is just a one big hologram, run crewed by holograms. Um. And I think the original officer was killed in the incident that they mentioned in the episode mm-hmm. when the ship was attacked. 
Um, and I think the whole shrapnel thing coming onto the ship was all for Picard's benefit, um, especially because he wouldn't leave him, leave him touch the, the generator, the dermal gener- regenerator. Um, and he didn't really clean the wound properly. He just spe- splashed alcohol onto it. And Picard never really drank the alcohol either. So I think, and also, like as Picard pointed out, the ship is immaculate. Everything kind of fits perfectly to keep Picard happy. Like again, the the hospitality um, hologram. I like so I like the idea that the ship is 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 being run by holograms. I, you know, and they're sentient. I think that's quite an interesting uh, theory. But that does go completely in, uh, you know, against the law that there is no synthetic life. If you know you've got a ship that is manned by holograms, that you know that is synthetic life. Yeah, but we saw what in Voyager, what the Doctor, he, what he eventually became, yeah. and now this is what is it twenty years yeah. later? What, 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 yeah, so we don't know how far holograms have progressed. Like they might be sentient, but they might be aware enough to run to 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 do like a holodeck basically to run the ship like that, mm. you know. So basically, I, I like the idea. I think that it'd be a fascinating idea that the captain is a hologram as well, because why is why as a captain? Would you have everybody else looking like you? Well, you know? they also sort of like explain to that because he likes to keep his own company. Yeah, it just yeah. But I, I do think uh, that uh, you might be onto something with that. Yeah, I, I, I would love that to be true. I think that would be nice. You yeah. Know? And then my final one, which I just kind of came up with there, as we were chatting, um, and I don't know why I, th- I just thought of it. I think that Doctor Mad- 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 Maddox. Yeah has been assimilated by the Borg and the Romulans now have him are you have him trapped are using him now uh, he and his knowledge to create an army of androids based on Son's type of androids I think they're using him I think he's been assimilated somehow and we're going to see him uh, as, as a clo- as, as a drone on the ship somewhere mm-hmm. um no, again, I thought maybe he was as we spoke in the past you know, the last few days I thought maybe he was also an android going for thousands of years old that was actually the nest is actually uh, uh, a world we'll say or, or, or a race of androids that are have been created thousands of years ago by the Romulans or the Vulcans and that um, the reason he appeared in the, the generation episode to try and take data and take him apart was to study him to improve his culture yeah. as well um, I quite like that theory, but I think I'm going to stick with the one where he's a he's a he's been assimilated. Okay. And we're going, and that we're going to see him on the show somehow because I've checked the IMBD and all that kind of stuff, and he doesn't appear as the character, an actor. Now I know sometimes they don't put him up; they hide secrets and stuff. You know, mm. he doesn't actually he's not actually credited as being on the show, so except the name only. Right. Okay. So I don't know what you think about that one. I think it'd be interesting if he was a a, a, a Borg drone and he all he, and the drones and then the, the Borg have all his knowledge. I've I've you um know? I was thinking that maybe he could be actually what was left over from the um, Romulan conflict with AI a thousand years ago, right. uh, and the reason why he wanted to study data. Was to create more, uh, you know, more synthetic life like him. Yeah, and, and yeah. learn from how data was constructed, so he could produce more of of him. Yeah, that was kind of our first theory yeah. I was talking to you about, really. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I, I think that you know, at the moment, we don't have enough information to really sort of no. <laughs> uh, say it's, it's all very much conjecture and where we think we're going. Yeah, I, I think that this. Uh, is all linked together with discovery. I have to, I have yeah, to admit my 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 theory because uh, season two of Discovery was looking at AI about the battle against control, um, mm-hmm. and I think that that might still exist there. I have had another thought about uh, AI, which I'll talk about when I've gone through this. But for me, yeah. the board cube it's been stripped, obviously for labour and tech. And I think yeah. we can say that's pretty much confirmed. That's, yeah, that's a tick yeah. for you. Um, yeah. I think <laughs> there was Romulan 
Federation uh, activity ongoing at the time of the collapse of the Romulan star, um, which, again, uh, Raffi effectively confirmed because she said she had evidence, although we never saw what that was or anything. Hmm. I think Commodore Ro, who wasn't on this week, but I think she's more likely Tal Shiar posing as a Vulcan, um, possibly with the knowledge of Admiral Clancy, yeah, um, which is maybe where some of that Romulan Federation cooperation comes together as well. Or mm. she's a Vulcan from the Mirror Universe. Yeah, we were saying that last week, you know, the you know, Mirror yeah. Universe is here. And she's been sent to destabilise the Prime Universe, which kind of like gives the vibes of Star Trek The Undiscovered Country does all of that. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, I think that Soji's mother, she's just there to control them. And yeah, and I think that there. she's an AI. Uh, I yeah. don't think she's Maddox, but I think she might be control from Discovery. Uh, yeah. I think that Borg have originated maybe with the Romulans. Um, and could the Borg, you know, uh, be disabled right after assimilating Ramda screw because they've been injected with some sort of genetic marker? Which is based on mm. what the conversations that we had, uh, and that would prevent yeah. them from from uh, being assimilated. And I think that that's if uh, you know if they're in the the super secret Romulan order. I don't think it's the normal yeah. Romulan population. Um, I'm wondering, did Romulans actually invent uh, like the the twin synthetic thing well before humans did as well? Yeah, well, that kind of goes back to my theory. I still think the Vulcans and the Romulans, before they split, were responsible for the Borg. Mm. I still think, and that kind of feeds what you're seeing there, you know. I, I'm going to bring in what I, the thing I'm just going to throw in from, mm. a, from a wild side now. Yeah. I'm not so sure whether or not they created them, but did they right. come across a sentient race? And I'm thinking that that sentient race might have been uh, the same race of synthetic creatures that sent Vija back to Earth in Star Trek The Motion yeah. Picture. Yeah, you were saying that in our, in our chat. Yeah. That's quite an in- I quite like that theory. That that that, that that's really yeah. I th- I th- yeah, that no? that would be a, a good way of bringing that in. I think. Yeah. Um, and could that have originally have been set up or could the Borg have been set up with maybe a bit of time travel thrown in uh, of mm. the Decker Ilea joining at the end of Star Trek The Motion Picture? Yeah. So just, you know, throwing them out there as wild ideas. Um, mm. I also think that we will discover that the nest is actually um, there because of control. Um, right. which was Section 31's AI and risk assessment <laughs> system and the main bad mm. guy in Discovery because we knew that yeah. then that it could take over human forms, but it, yeah. it wasn't like a synthetic person. Could, over the uh, 80 on, uh, you know, 100 years since that had actually happened and it was defeated by Discovery, could... Mm. It have been working in the background somewhere, trying to perfect its way of becoming more human to, you know, infiltrate areas. And that's what we're actually seeing now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that, that for me feels, feels like it ties it up a bit more because surely, you know, it's it, because of the, what it was, was control. It could be in multiple mm. places. So why, when you kill one character that's taken over by it, does it kill all of it? It didn't feel yeah. right. <coughs> I don't know. I'm still, I'm still on the fence in that one. Like I said to you, I, I just, it feels too much on the nose, you know. Yeah. Um. But again, if it, if it is, it's an interesting one. It's, it, it's a good way of connecting. It yeah, all and I think that basically control is trying to infiltrate the Federation and Romulan society to find out about other AIs. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Girati, I think she's more likely to be a spy for uh, Commodore O. Because, to be honest, I find it she's just too 
innocent, naive, and a bit creepy. <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> why are you creepy? She, she's asked too many questions. She wants to be involved in too much. Yeah, but you not find out more uh, synthetic traits, uh, android traits, the way they yeah, used to be. Yeah, well, you, you know? know, I am thinking an alternative might be, uh, which is similar to exactly what you've said, is is she actually an AI, and she's been mm. sent to uh, Daystrom to look out for uh, Daj, but also yeah. to um, b- uh, basically look. You know, look out for anybody who might be asking questions uh, yeah. about the AI. Uh, so I think that she might have been planted at Daystrom. And yeah. I think that all of this with Commodore Rowe approaching her and stuff like that, you know, maybe Commodore Rowe is killed. It's a possibility. Yeah, because, because when Picard went to Daystrom, it was very convenient that the one person he met was her. Yeah. And she had all the information he was looking for. And also she made the comment, like, this is my day off. Why, why, why did you have to come today? Yeah. You know? um, and she kind of have every, she had everything he really needed to know to set him on the journey he had to go yeah, on. And, you know? Or to send him in the direction he had to go. It was too... too and convenient. not only that, but, you know, Picard is now saying she's Earth's leading expert. Well, where did that yeah. come from? She worked at the Daystrom Institute. She was Dr. Maddox's assistant yeah so she's not earth's leading because maddox would be you see i think picard knows there's something up with her he knows something and that's why he's been so lenient about her leaving her on the ship leave her tag along not doing the security checks all that kind of yeah. stuff you know i think he, he he's going to use her in f- for for getting what he yeah. wants i i i think that that you know I, either picard mm. is very naive which he's never been no which, which or not, no, he's not he done. knows that she's, uh, she, you know, she's yeah. something up with her and he's keeping an eye on her. Yeah. You know, again, I said this last week, but, you know, is Daj and Soji like the the light and the dark? So Soji's yeah. like the destroyer, as it were. I'm just, you know, I'm just seeing another theory is what if, you know, she creates, uh, um, I'm trying to think of what, what this one was when I put my notes down. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that was it. What if, as well, Girati has created the synths yeah. um, against the ban on synthetic life, and you know she's yeah, she's trying to course. protect them. Maybe that could be another Maybe. another thing. But I think it's more likely. I think that she's uh, probably going. She's um, work well. I think that she's pretending to work for Commodore Rowe, but she's yeah. actually working for herself, and I think she's synthetic. Yeah, I, I think the synthetic one could be that could be definitely the one yeah. I think. Um, and with Soji being the destroyer, and this supposedly yeah. happening a thousand years ago, uh, could we actually see you know some sort of time travel which leads to the yeah. formation of the Jat Vash uh, yeah. and all of that, possibly using the Guardian of Forever, which would link back to you know the uh, reference that was in the show earlier on as well with the yeah um you know the the writer of that show's uh, name being in there you know uh Harlan Ellison's oh uh, yeah so there's a few ideas i've got yeah um yeah i mean there's some good theories there um i think next week we'll get, we we should get hopefully get some more i think we need to get some answers now at yeah. this stage you know, and the other thing was like we don't really know how many of the Romulans survived either, do we? From the supernova, no. you know? Yeah, there's no real information there about that. Um, I, I'm still struggling with this supernova idea because yeah, a star in order to go to supernova, it has to be a certain sort of like mass or whatever, but it would happen over yeah. tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So. Mm. There has to have been an external force which destroyed that star or made it go to supernova. Yeah. And I think that that is something that needs to be unpicked in the show. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, for an episode that didn't have much in us, we we, we came up with a lot of theories. For... Yeah, we, we definitely did, because I think we're grasping 
grasping at straws at the moment, aren't we? Trying to figure out what's going to happen because it's all a part of the fun of the show. And this, and this is yeah. why I actually, I really like the fact that they're not just sticking it all on so you binge watch it all at once. Yeah, I agree with you because otherwise we wouldn't have these. I don't think we'd be in, as in depth to us as we are no. at the moment. You know, it's that it's a, it's like that must watch, must watch or appointment TV as yeah. call it. We used to have as kids when you didn't have all this Netflix and we were a lot older, obviously. Um, and you had this appointment TV where you had to be home for nine o'clock to watch Dallas. So you had to watch whatever yeah. you're watching, the old school stuff, you know. Um, for me now, I think it's time to move on. He, Picard kind of has assembled his crew, if, like the Avengers have assembled, if that yeah. makes sense. And he, it's just, it's about time, it's time now to to get going like I know next week's episode is directed again by Jonathan mm. Fricks so and I think they go to free free load or is it we finally get free to see cloud. what that place is like free cloud sorry I'm thinking of something else uh, free load or what's that is that a movie that's something um, again a nice little cliffhanger this week really as well with um, 7 of 9 they didn't really have that the no. last few weeks so that was a nice little cliffhanger again to kind of hold you for next week you know um yeah i was delighted with it uh, so far so good move on to episode five next week and probably have another big show again for us between the two of us hopefully <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean because uh, we've well sh- should we say about what we've uh, been thinking as well Oh, about uh, the series finishing, what we're going to do next and stuff. Is it? I leave that okay. down too. Well, the idea is is that uh, because we've enjoyed doing these so much, we're uh, yeah. possibly looking at the idea of carrying on with the uh, Picard. Well, not Picard, but the sort of like Star Trekky kind of theme. Yeah, and maybe looking yeah. at some of the previous ones and working our way through, um, looking at you know the opening ones and doing a bit of a uh, retrospective review of what those yeah. were like and you know what was good about them what didn't work you know all of that sort of stuff um, and then yeah. after we've done all of the different series go on to season t- uh, you know, uh, episode two and three, three and four yeah. and working our way through that because there's you know we could keep this up for hundreds of months <laughs> yeah I think so and I think build towards season three of discovery as well yeah absolutely Uh, i think season three of discovery because there's going to be a lot of new stuff in that you know that that's really is on new ground charting new ground yeah they've they've wiped the 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 slate clean yeah they've effectively got rid of the federation um apart from maybe six or so planets which i think is there um i've heard rumors that uh, maybe the people who we think are humans are not. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's the other way around sort of thing. So it's humans still battling against AI, which is, <laughs> if that's the case, that makes it, it made me feel even more that, you know, this is all about control. Well, that goes back to the Dr. Gerati's comment when she laughed at him, maybe in a thousand yeah. years, they could build synthetics. So, you know, maybe that's them setting up the, that, that story. Yeah, because well. they are about a thousand years in the future. Nine, 960 years, I think. I watched a, a, a video. The, the the trailer was a couple of minutes long. And I watched a breakdown that was 30 minutes long of every every clip. It's just, I, my wife was just watching me. Look, what are you watching? 30 minute show about a YouTube thing about a three minute trailer. And I'm just, shh, 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 you don't understand. I have to see everything. Yeah, they, 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 they don't get it. They don't get it. It's, uh, no, no. But, but you know, they'll they'll pause Emmerdale and stuff like that. And oh, yeah. Corey and all those sort of programs. And you were thinking, oh. why? <laughs> why? Well, thankfully, we don't have the, the soaps in our house. But anyway. So that's it. Another great show, I think. Yeah, Hayden. and hopefully everybody else will have enjoyed well, them as well. Nearly a hundred, nearly an hour and forty minutes. Not not far off. Yeah, it's not it's not bad, isn't it? That we could do a breakdown of the show that's longer than the show itself. <laughs> I know. Well, that's just I, I blame you for that because you, your recaps usually recaps are the first ten seconds of of of, uh, of the new episode, but 
I have to commend you on your 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 work. I do try to do my homework on it. Yeah, I know. I can't fault you know. It's brilliant. Right. It puts me to shame. I I feel bad. I don't. I don't. I'm oh no! You, you've you've got you, some great theories. <laughs> you know, and it's it's really good that we yeah. can bounce those ideas off each other. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you know, uh, we we come to a, a good third place when you, you you say oh I think it's this and I think well I'm not so sure about that because of this but if we did it this way <laughs> yeah. and then it works and then you know it's great yeah. isn't it yeah it's great yeah I think I enjoy the podcast nearly as much as the show <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too all right then well uh, okay. we'll call it a day for there hope you've enjoyed it uh, and yeah, we'll definitely. be back. <laughs> For, for episode yeah. five, uh, probably about this time yeah. next week. Hope you've enjoyed it, yeah. um, and uh, we'll see you soon. So it's a good night from me. And it's a good night for him, and it's slow on from me. Good night. Good night. Good night.